Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the panel called Trust as a Social Capital, UNDP Perspective. My name is Alma Mirvich, and I work as the Joint Regional Program Coordinator in UNDP Bosnia-Herzegovina. It gives me uh, great pleasure to um, be joined today for this panel by um, four amazing uh, women who will be delivering presentations and discussing today this very important and uh, topical theme of trust. Um, so um, essentially, COVID and other crises that our world has experienced in the past has certainly um, looked into trust as, as an important resource in a community, in, in a family. And uh, the crisis like this has um, shown us that if other forms of things seem to be collapsing and the world is changing before our eyes in every single segment, trust is that uh, particular resource that we rely on to keep our keep ourselves connected, to keep ourselves glued, and it's an essential element in social cohesion. I mean, certainly through the program that I have been involved with, uh, we have largely looked at the interplay of social cohesion in connectedness and understood that as social cohesion is a multidimensional and complex concept. It is. It really uh, hits at the core of everything, and uh, it is. It has come to the forefront of many, many policy discussions, especially now during this global crisis. Um, without much further ado, since we have very experienced panelists today, I wanted to first introduce our. Uh, key speaker, Liana Dedera, who will set the stage for our discussion today. Um, and let me briefly uh, introduce Deliana, who assumed her duties as the UN DP resident representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina in May last year. She has also worked for UNDP in uh, Serbia, Kosovo, and Kazakhstan, and previously worked for DFID in Moldova. Uh, Stiliana holds a master's in development management uh, and is currently studying towards a second master in a global diplomacy. So Stiliana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alma. It is a pleasure to be part of this panel and uh, to speak uh, uh, at the Belgrade Security Forum on this topic of trust, which I think is a, a great um, lens that brings together so many uh, streams of thought and streams of work during this year. Why is UNDP uh, looking at trust? Um, as Alma, you said in the beginning, rightly so, the crisis this year has brought to the spotlight or has put in stark contrast uh, the matter of the fabric of the society, the matter of people trusting each other, connecting to each other, helping each other, but also to what extent the citizens follow the uh, instructions and trust uh, the measures taken by the local governments or the central government. This uh, links either horizontal between people or between people and groups and, and people and the governments and vertical, uh, the, the, the respect for the rules established within a country by a government are the very basis of yeah. governance. And uh, all, we are this year in particular talking about um, immediate issues, uh, critical issues triggered by the crisis, but we are also trying to learn as fast as possible to see what are some of the systemic questions that we will need to uh, uh, solve sooner rather than later in order to enable a longer term, uh, more sustainable pace of recovery and support development like positive changes but which are also purposeful positive changes. UNDP has prepared at the beginning of this year specific guidelines on social cohesion because we recognize that it is foundational for all the work that we are doing in the countries where we are present. Uh, it is very important to uh, understand spot early on um, lack of uh, hate speech, lack of trust between citizens, where uh, the uh, rules or uh, the institutions of governance are not fully trusted or uh, don't function well or are weak. And uh, with this in mind, we need to think about 
how to put to best use uh, the tools offered to us in the 21st century to build better societies, to support our partners build better societies. The key message is that we cannot solve the challenges of the 21st century when we live in a space which is much more connected through internet, which is much more connected through social media for all the citizens. Uh, which is much more influenced by the rapid industrial changes, which fuels in turn digital transformation and digital connectedness. So all this new environment cannot be governed by tools that were established in the 20th century. So 21st century governance calls for an adjusted toolkit that is inspired by the 21st century reality. So in this toolkit of the 21st century, we recognize the social cohesion, the trust, and the social contract between citizen and the state as a, important and, and um, cornerstone um, um, definitions or, or uh, elements. Um, as UNDP, um, I would like to structure, and in, in my position in my work, I would like to break down now this conversation at three levels. So uh, applying to the issues this year, look at specific issues with the trust, in the, action, in the action taken by governments. Uh, and then looking at this uh, social capital and the trust that, and how it showed up uh, in middle level, for example, in the uh, actions undertaken by civil society organizations, by the private sector with uh, uh, the citizens. And the lowest level is what did this uh, year show us in terms of interaction between people? So I, I think that, um, Speaking very roughly and without any science uh, and empirical data behind, we see that during this year, uh, many um, exemplar initiatives that came from citizen mobilizing themselves, the self-help group, the spirit of volunteerism that came through very strongly and people in their neighborhoods helping each other and putting in place um, initiatives when they care for the elderly, when uh, they exchange information, uh, when uh, the uh, community groups are organizing themselves to make sure that services are and the, the community moves forward together. We also see many examples when uh, uh, civil society organizations and also uh, private sector step through to change quickly some of their projects and initiatives to um, provide services differently uh, to their community or uh, in the partnerships that they have uh, with the local self-administration. Um, then higher up, what we see is that uh, in the Western Balkans, and in particular, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, the, uh, some of the tools in the public sector, public services were hit most by the crisis. And this is where I think we, we saw a lot of potential for uh, uh, building further the, the trust and the source of cohesion. Uh, globally, we also saw that the governments are most affected in terms of the social capital that they enjoy from the citizens. And applying this additional complexity of uh, the, the 21st century, I think that the challenges for all the governments immediately ahead of us are definitely try to rethink the social contract that they have with their citizens and try to be, use more uh, the participation, the civic engagement through uh, uh, digital means and also listening more to the voice of the citizens uh, by all means possible. So uh, in the Western Balkans, we are drawing a lot of inspiration from uh, the uh, bridging and the, the social capital building initiatives that is happening through two initiatives. Most importantly, the Dialogue for the Future, which is a joint initiative of three UN agencies, uh, the United Nations Development Program, uh, UNESCO and UNICEF, uh, are working in uh, uh, Serbia, Montenegro and Bosnia and Herzegovina to promote uh, joint work, joint dialogue and coming together of young people, and women, of decision makers um, in discussing priority issues, designing uh, to, uh, joint solution, but most importantly, working together through joint initiatives. We have run a call for joint projects and the uptake and the interest was amazing. It was much higher than we could have supported. And we have seen a lot of organizations that were ready to establish trilateral or quadrilateral 
partnerships to uh, to work together. So uh, we hope that uh, this uh, enthusiasm and energy is actually showing us good signs of a readiness uh, to collaborate and, and strengthen this social capital across uh, the country boundaries and and move it more towards through the throughout the entire region. Um, civil society organizations are very important contributor to uh, the well-being of people. So um, they are an important service provider in the community, making sure that um, some of the services that the government cannot cater to the citizens are there and they are of good quality. They are also representing the voices of their members and they are a watchdog looking for the protection of respective rights. So from this point of view, um, the RELOW, the Regional Local Democracy Program funded by the European Union, is uh, strengthening these mechanisms through which local governments can work with civil society, contracting them and channeling financing information so the civil society can play this important role, can contribute to the life of the community and improve the life of uh, its citizens. Through both of these initiatives, we are hearing lots of positive stories, we are hearing voices, and this is what we'd like also to share with you today through this panel. So thank you very much, Alma, and uh, uh, over back to you. Uh, thank you, Stoliana. Uh, this was very, very interesting, and thank you for sharing UNDP Bosnia, particularly experience in, in uh, regional interventions. Um, I'll follow up very quickly on what you said in terms of the importance of governance and governance being uh, inclusive um, as especially local governments, which are the first instance where citizens come to uh, for you know, basic services. And uh, thank you for also flagging the important you know, role of civil society and, and UNDP through both of these uh, programs that you referenced has strongly cooperated with civil society to you know, make sure that this dialogue between governments at various level and the community at large is strengthened because civil society has the necessary resources to tap into you know, the pulse of the community. And um, certainly, um, this, this is a very good segue to uh, call on our next speaker, which is Ms. Aida Daguda, who leads the Center for Civil Society Promotion in Bosnia-Herzegovina and is an experienced uh, program manager with over 20 years of experience in international uh, and local civil society. Um, uh, also, Aida has contributed to establishing the largest uh, mentorship network for women in Bosnia-Herzegovina and to uh, many, many regional initiatives in the Western Balkans. Um, I am certainly happy that we have worked together uh, on many occasions. And um, uh, Aida, I wanted to give you the floor to ask you to also comment on what Steliana said, but I would like to hear your thoughts on um, how do you see the interplay between, you know, social cohesion uh, and resilience to crisis, like what we're having now? Obviously, trust being an integral element in social cohesion. How do you see, how do you see the role of civil society from your perspective? Uh, thank you, Alma. It is a pleasure for me to be part of this uh, Belgian forum, but. Um, uh, this topic in general of this panel is really wide and I'm thinking uh, which focus to have here. But um, about resilience uh, to crisis, it's really very... Um, we have that situation right now. In theory, in order to build a resilient community and to foster community resilience, the community members' voices need to be heard and they should be part of different kinds of activities uh, in the society. Uh, but in practice, um, I believe that our society is lacking building of resilience, but uh, different crises, unfortunately we have numerous crises in, uh, after the war, as the biggest crisis here, but uh, proven that social cohesion exists and that uh, solidarity and voluntarism are deeply rooted in our uh, beings. Um, actually, maybe it will sound strange, but uh, it seems that the big crisis uh, actually contribute to waking up social cohesion uh, in our country. Um, in these unfortunate events, such as uh, big floods in uh, 2014, for example, or even pandemic situation that we have right now, um, different boundaries uh, 
and limitation vanishing, allowing people to help each other, regardless of nationality, of geographical, political, or national affiliation. Um, in my opinion, um, it is really necessary to uh, closely analyze this pandemic situation and uh, its impact to uh, social cohesion. cohesion. I mean, it's still uh, ongoing, but uh, uh, for instance, at the beginning of the crisis, when total lockdown was present, uh, different voluntary actions were undertaken throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina and the region, supporting uh, vulnerable citizens and groups in our society. It was great to see uh, that solidarity is strong in this type of situation, but the situation has changed over the time. Uh, as we have seen, our government doesn't have, unfortunately, a proper answer to this situation, and uh, we became aware that we have to take care of ourselves and, uh, more importantly, to separate from each other so that social cohesion is uh, uh, less present and less visible. In fact, I'm really afraid that uh, this long-term situation, now we know it will be long-term, uh, will decrease level of solidarity and uh, alienate citizens and different groups from each other. And that will negatively affect the resilience to crisis in future. So it is uh, necessary to take care about this aspect as soon as possible. Uh, some of the measures should be taken right now during the crisis. For example, uh, media are very important uh, because they inform people, but unfortunately uh, they do not cover so much positive stories and uh, cases of solidarity among citizens uh, that can motivate uh, all other citizens and give more hope to overcome this situation. So uh, I believe that that's where social networks jump in. And we should uh, and must use this. This is also a media. So it is, but it's not in classical terms, media outlet, but it's very important. Uh, for instance, in April this year, we have started, our organization has started a specially dedicated Facebook page uh, for promotion of uh, solidarity and voluntarism because uh, uh, we can see that media didn't give enough uh, highlighting that, that type of story, so we have to do something about that. So some other similar activities can and should be uh, organized during the crisis. And after the crisis, I believe that a special program should be designed in order to rec reconnect people, in order to build social cohesion and therefore resilience to crisis, because I I think that nobody knows what will be effect, real effect of this uh, uh, long-term crisis to our society. So uh, maybe that's for the beginning. And uh, I really believe, as uh, Staliano said, about the importance of civil society. But uh, you know, I believe that mental health is endangered in this crisis, and that will have long-term effects to all of us. Thank you, Aida. I will, uh, I will, uh, I mean, what you said uh, definitely added to what Stiliana said. And for me, uh, especially, you know, um, your introduction about people's voices need to be heard. That really connects very well with that kind of inclusive government that we want at any level. And, you know, we've seen in, in, in all of the countries of the region that because, you know, the crisis has called for decisions to be made very quickly. I think people's perceptions about how included they were in the decision-making process certainly uh, perhaps were more on the negative because of just the mode that everybody was and is continuing to function in. But on the other side, you know, this crisis has certainly opened up space for a lot of innovation. So while we had to socially distance, we could see that many of the digital platforms are growing and you know you know we had to grow and accustomed to use them to be able to connect and to kind of almost substitute for the 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 physical alienation that we had to experience but but i certainly agree with you that you know this is a field that needs to be paid special attention to because it is the very social capital that we carry individually as, as a group and, and, and as physical beings, uh, all as members of a community that, you know, uh, we'll certainly have to rely on. I, I would like to now call on, on Aisha Hajbegovic, uh, who uh, joins us from uh, Montenegro. Aisha is a specialist of youth policy and intercultural non-formal political education. 
She has a long-standing experience in, in leading several civil society organizations in Montenegro, uh, where she worked on uh, human rights, civic participation, and youth work programs. I show as a, as a background in applied conflict transformation. And uh, Aisha, also welcome to the panel. We're happy that you are with us. Um, I wanted to also ask for your perspective on the questions that we've explored so far, both from sort of social, you know, uh, trust as a social capital from a governance perspective and from a perspective of civil society, sort of if you could comment on that. Thank you. Uh, with all this uh, all uh, women uh, uh, panel and this is what uh, what I want to to note first uh, I think uh, uh, building trust and social cohesion somehow is uh, in the realm of what is interesting for for women uh, and this is something that I think needs to be uh, tackled a little bit so that we don't play let's say polarized societies where men are discussing security and women are discussing cohesion and trust uh, hopefully uh, uh, this we can we can challenge all, already here um, what uh, what I need to 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 say around the, the the trust in the society I think it's it's very obvious that um, there is uh, some kind of detachment and uh, uh, some kind of lack of uh, uh, connection between the uh, institutions, uh, political elites, and citizens, and this is something that uh, that is becoming a trend. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, say that's something that uh, uh, is uh, to stay as such, but we need to address it. Uh, and I'm I'm thinking uh, to what level are citizens actually actually aware that they have power. To address this, uh, all the uh, uh, all the time there seems to be a responsibility uh, uh, on the side of the uh, political elites and, and authorities to be more, uh, let's say, uh, closer to be closer towards the, the citizens. But I think there is an important element, especially missing in the Western Balkan uh, um, context, where the the civic activism or the, the, the belonging to the civic part of the society and, and being aware of the power that we have as citizens is something that is often missing. And here I need to add to my, from my background and with, the, with the youth work and the importance of uh, young people and actually their uh, both education in these terms, but also uh, opportunities that they have to experience civic engagement from the early uh, early years and early ages uh, so that they can see that this is something this is the the, the responsibility of us, us as citizens and how we can change things how we can change things that we see in our societies that we don't necessarily like which is connected also to building to building the the the, the trust in the society but also uh, creating a society that's better or the societies that are better for 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 all of us uh, I think part of that is that uh, uh, um, the approach, again, in the Western Balkan often is, and, and all the energy that we focus on, if you look at the different actors in the, in the systems, uh, is on finding who, whom to blame for the different problems that we are facing. And we know we are facing quite a lot of problems, so there is no an issue there. Uh, what, what, what I'm missing and what I think would need to, to happen is almost a change in a, in a mindset that we actually focus our energy on, on building the cooperation, on finding solutions, on investing our uh, different expertises and competencies into uh, jointly building something that can actually uh, change the status quo on the, whatever given issue that we are not satisfied, rather than merely looking to whom to blame and then you know, not changing anything. So I'll, I'll stop here, not to hijack the panel as well. But thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Asha. This was uh, very useful, and I'm happy that you um, you brought to the discussion the issue of the disconnect. Uh, I mean, not very recently, uh, we certainly all saw the analysis from the Regional Cooperation Council that publishes annually the Balkan Public Opinion Barometer, and uh, you know. It was a mixed report. It was a mixed report that uh, for this year showed, unfortunately, um, an increasing trend of crumbling confidence of the citizens of the region, 
the Western Balkan six in public institutions. So certainly the, you know, the crisis uh, could uh, make, make the situation much more aggravated. Um, but as, as Teljana said, you know, the 21st century challenges call for 21st century solutions. What we could rely on before may no longer be the case for us to deal with what we have to deal with now. So, um, and, and an important point for me certainly is the fact that, you know, no country is alone in this and making sure that we face this crisis, like the floods that you mentioned, AIDA in 2014, which covered and, and affected this region greatly, is that we can't, no country can do this alone. It, it definitely has to be through cooperation. So whether it's the cooperation at state level, whether it's the cooperation of civil society organizations, partnering and, and doing things jointly, uh, definitely, uh, you know, this kind of horizontal links between organizations and between people, this, this bridging capital will be important but also vertically within our respective countries. Um, I can't see Stelian, I can't see uh, Svetlana uh, on the screen, uh, but I would like to very much introduce uh, our uh, fourth speaker, um, which is uh, Svetlana Stefanovic, who is the executive director of the Belgrade uh, um, Security Forum and is a program coordinator at the Belgrade Fund for Political Excellence. Uh, we have uh, certainly cooperated in the past and I'm happy that she is with us today. Uh, Svetlana is a recognized specialist in, in government uh, uh, governance programs and development and has also set up mentoring programs. Uh, she is also on the original team of the Belgrade uh, Security Forum and, and I take this opportunity to congratulate you and your team on the 10th anniversary of the forum. Um, uh, let me also mention that, that Svetlana is a member of the program board of the Women Leadership Academy. Uh, Svetlana, if you can hear me, I know you are in Belgrade. Um, I would kindly ask you to join us and also hear your views on, on what has been said so far, and especially on this interplay of, of trust um, uh, as, as, as an important social capital resource. And how do you see this from, from both the governance perspective and, and your experience as, as a member of the civil society? Uh, thank you, Alma, very much. And thank you for congratulations on our 10th anniversary of Belgrade Security Forum. Uh, I'm really uh, uh, happy that I am part of this panel and I'm really sorry that you are not uh, here with us in Belgrade. Uh, but actually, it's, it's a new uh, uh, normality for all of us and we really all try uh, uh, to be connected on a different way. So this uh, uh, new uh, uh, way of communication and uh, doing this is really uh, uh, something that uh, reminds us all the time uh, that uh, even though that we use uh, all of different kind of uh, tools, uh, still that connections and relations and that we are not uh, uh, all together in the same place uh, uh, make a little bit difference. Um, symbolically, our uh, whole uh, Belgrade Security Forum is about trust. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, the very important thing uh, for all of us. Uh, and uh, when we talk about trust, uh, we return to our core values and we mentioned several times solidarity and that's really uh, something that uh, uh, came out uh, during the crisis only. And in a way we lost that in our daily work. Uh, for us from civil society organization is a little bit different, but still I think that we don't use enough uh, um, uh, resources that we have to build our networks and actually to use all the networks that we uh, have not only uh, in the region but also globally. Uh, and in that way, uh, uh, even though that we live uh, in um, societies that, uh, and actually in the age uh, of internet, and we have a lot of different informations that are um, um, close to us and we can find whatever we want, uh, still on a local level and on a different uh, levels, we don't uh, uh, actually um, have people who are well informed. 
Um, and uh, that's that moment that uh, uh, we need to actually work uh, uh, on that in a progressive way uh, to start to connect uh, with each other and to help uh, each other because the problem on the local level uh, show what is wrong on the national level as well and I think that all changes are really starting from the local level. Uh, and this crisis, actually, and whole pandemic situation uh, bring, uh, brings a new, uh, um, let's say, not values, but uh, uh, new that's a things that are important, uh, and that is uh, courage, uh, that is uh, uh, development and empathy. Uh, and I think because of all of that, that uh, women uh, that are leading uh, countries that were like fighting with the COVID-19 on the best way are uh, a proof of that, that we actually uh, are ready for a new leadership, uh, where people uh, believe what you are talking to them, and if you are speaking from your heart and then they uh, uh, and speak openly even though if it's something it's a problem and or it's not uh, but uh, if you are open uh, with direct informations uh, people will um, will trust you and uh, if you're following the steps that you promised the people will trust you uh, so I think that uh, women have that kind of uh, um, uh, not only capacities, but uh, uh, the new way how to deal uh, uh, with the crisis. Uh, and another important thing uh, is actually that we have a lot of networks, and I, I suppose that all of us uh, on the panel, uh, we are all connected with a different uh, organization uh, from our countries, from region, from region, from different Western Balkans countries, but also globally, also on a European uh, level. But I think that sometimes we really don't use it on the right way. Um, because it's a struggle, actually, and uh, uh, we all together can change uh, uh, something. And of course, um, we cannot do that uh, alone. We can start that, uh, but uh, we will go step by step, and it, la and it lasts very long. But if we are together, and if we exchange opinions, thoughts, and actually ask for help if we need or share our views, uh, we can deal with that. Uh, uh, um, directly and uh, faster uh, because we don't have uh, uh, enough time uh, uh, to do that everything. Time is really something that is go very, very fast and uh, uh, that's something that we are uh, taking for granting, you know, like we have time and we can do whatever we want, but uh, actually it's completely different and this pandemic situation actually showed us that uh, time is a really valuable resource that we uh, need always to rethink uh, again. Um, and I think that people, in a way, because of that uh, uh, informational uh, part, and actually uh, we are all on some kind of network, social networks, and we are like connected, uh, but we really missed uh, that uh, uh, the situations are, doesn't change on, uh, on internet. Uh, for some changes, you will just need to go uh, directly to people, to speak with them, to ask what they need, and to try to change uh, 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 things with them. And because of that, I think that uh, cooperation uh, uh, between state institutions, uh, governance, and uh, 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 civil society organization is actually crucial. We lost it somehow, uh, and it's really important to... Um, foster that kind of dialogue and exchange uh, and actually uh, to try to put everything that is uh, in a framework and we all almost have a solid uh, uh, form, uh, formal uh, framework for work. We have all laws, we have strategies, we have everything, but actually if you don't do that uh, every day, then people will lose the trust. And I think that we all need to work more uh, together, of course, and uh, we will make a change, that's for sure. Uh, and also I believe that mutual support, um, especially through mentoring work, um, as, um, it's really um, a step forward for all of us uh, to help each other uh, because you know, some point of time we all face with the same problems and the, with the same challenges. But if you have uh, somebody that share uh, that you can do it uh, and that she or he can help you, then it's much easier for all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Svetlana. This was uh, very comprehensive and also um, gives me an excellent segue to ask a couple of follow-up questions that, 
that I got from from all of your presentations. Um, and and the sort of I, I see a lot of emerging uh, connecting dots between what you're saying, uh, both in terms of uh, where do we get our information about, and does that you know does false information or, or unchecked information threaten the trust? I mean, Aida, you mentioned that uh, you know there were a lot of the you know the media news that came up uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, which was unchecked, and I, I recall certainly all of that frenzy of different types of information that we were getting on on various uh, social media networks about what's really happening. So, so that's important. And then there was another element that Aisha, you mentioned about education of young people. So what do young people learn uh, that is going to tomorrow uh, make them more engaged citizens? And, and certainly from what I know of, of social cohesion, civic participation, and this kind of, you know, engagement in a, in a civil society is is an, an an incredible and important element of cohesion so that you participate you are uh, an active member of your community and that generates trust and then uh svetlana what you said as well again about empathy and courage and the way you communicate uh you know news to the citizenry about what is happening and you mentioned uh several examples of female uh, leaders that we heard about, certainly globally, who uh, were commended for an exemplary leadership during this crisis as to how they talk to their citizenship about what's happening, what is what is the government doing about this crisis. So my, my follow-up question really is to all of you is sort of, um, if we if we think about the disconnect that we are afraid of right now and and the solidarity which is emerging so we can all tap into hopefully once you know this subsides and and you know we're all talking about the new normal you know what would be your recommendations from from your uh, perspectives as as you know women who are in leading positions you know Selyana, you're in UNDP and and working a lot with uh, local governments and governments uh, at different levels, and and we have um, Aisha, Aida, and and Svetlana from civil society. What would be your recommendations to safeguard the trust? Uh, you know, to make sure that we can again, you know, preserve this social capital for what's to come, because the world is changing before our eyes, and we will again, you know, need to make sure that we have this resource to count on, to again deal with the numerous challenges that are emerging now, but you know, some of them will certainly emerge at a later stage. So, um, Stelyana, first to you. And I will be very brief with, with uh, uh, some thoughts to contribute to the conversation. I think we, we are coming to the age when we need to use very simple words uh, to, uh, to build the future, yeah, to look at the next 10 years agenda up to 2030. Definitely, we're talking about uh, talking about peace. We're talking about trust. There's really foundational notions uh, that take us to do the foundation of, of society building and understanding uh, individuals' link to the family, to the community, to to the government. Uh, people are much more mobile these days, so they can choose the country they want to live in. They can be digital nomads. They can live elsewhere. What connects them then to a state? That these are some of the questions. Another thought is that we need to um, to recognize for what it is worth, uh, what is already happening, done by women in the families, in the community, caring during the COVID-19 crisis, ensuring the homeschooling, uh, ensuring the extra care, contributing to um, the, the mental stability and health of their family, but at the same time having a full-time job. These are things that need to be spelled out because I think that they are in the shadow, but they are essential to quantifying the value and the important work that is already happening to maintaining trust at a certain level. Definitely, I think that social, a strong social cohesion is essential for the societies to be able to move forward because if, if the government designs vision and strategic plan, but the people don't follow, then the, these uh, uh, goals would not be achieved. And the, the quantification of this social cohesion and trust will be definitely 
uh, uh, be can be done by by how much uh, we are able to to achieve in a short period of time. So although we are tend to deal with abstract notion, I think that this is the real time when we have to come back to the essentials, recognize the essential work that women are already doing in the family in the workplace, and really aim for equality and for parity. Over. Thank you very much. Aida, um, your thoughts on this from, from your perspective? Well, uh, it's a lot of thoughts after this discussion, but uh, I have to say that uh, I believe that uh, we have to stick to the basics about good governance. We all know that good governance means accountability, transparency, rule of law and uh, participation. And uh, we are also aware that uh, according to this definition, we have bad governance uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, in the region as well. But uh, when I say bad governance, um, we always thought about government only. But I want to stress out that it's very important that we use principles of good governance in all of different variety of organizations, of international organizations, civil society, government, of course, because uh, we already lost trust, you know. Because of bad governance, um, decades of bad governance, uh, we don't uh, trust to government and we don't trust to each other. We don't trust to civil society, to media. So it's as a mutual connection is distrust and we need it desperately to restore. So I believe that we have to start from ourselves as a person first and then our organ my organization uh, your organizations, UNDP, government, so we all have to speak to these principles of good governance because uh, of trust of our beneficiaries and community in our work. We have to start, start rebuilding trust step by step. And uh, also it's important to mention uh, uh, about um, civil society organizations. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, um, in the last, I don't know, seven to ten years, uh, we actually uh, see decrease of, uh, in the development of CSOs uh, across the region. So actually, instead of uh, improvement, we see deterioration of the uh, situation in civil society. And we have also a situation where many important CSOs stopped to work because of different uh, problems. And uh, we see uh, new generations coming. So. Um, it's very important to mention also women organization. I have to stress that out because uh, after the war, we are witnesses that uh, women were the first who crossed the boundaries, who start communication and uh, reconciliation process. Uh, and uh, that's very important because the women and women associations have that potential uh, built in. So uh, we have to preserve that potential and to develop it in future. So, but. Uh, Having in mind that uh, civil society organization now mostly struggling for survival, and uh, and uh, I have to mention also one illness is projectitis. We call it like that in our organization. When organization really act only if it's covered by some donor funding, you know, we as a civil society organization lost a little bit our true mission because we spend too much energy on survival you know, and uh, reading the donors' minds and needs and everything instead of reading uh, needs of our communities and our beneficiaries, you know. So we have to all together to find out the model, how to support a re really important uh, organization with big potential for uh, building community trust, maybe with some uh, innovative ways of support, you know, maybe some uh, general support grants, maybe some uh, specific capacity building, it's always needed, you know. So uh, a lot of issues on my mind, but I believe that these two recommendations are to start from ourselves and uh, something can be done and have to be done. Thank you, Aida. This is Thank an you, important is, uh, uh, premise that you mentioned, especially um, regarding the sort of um, projectizing work with civil society and uh, you know, I'm certainly wondering whether the myriad of informal community groups that have emerged across all our countries during the, the COVID crisis will remain as such, you know, these informal community groups that can act quickly, that can really like be there for the community. I would like to turn to Aisha. We're also getting questions from the audience and the time is, we, we have limited time. I'd like to ask Aisha if, uh, if 
you know, from your perspective as well, like what would be the recommendations that you see from, you know, both, the, you know, on the side of the governance and the side of, of the civil society to preserve this, you know, social capital as, as our resource um, in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would definitely go with also what Aida said that there is responsibility in all different actors in the society. So there is there is just no responsibility on only one side. And I think as soon as we recognize that, that each of us as individual, but also as a part of a group or part of an acting part of the society, uh, have responsibility in this, then we can collaborate easier and, and cooperate and uh, uni u u unite some of the uh, efforts together and, and reach more. But I think what, what I would recommend and what I'm recognizing uh, it's, it's, uh, it's happening and it's needed is that we would need to, to really aspire more. So what I'm mm. seeing that uh, even in these areas as, as solidarity is, um, you know, it takes, uh, uh, what, what Aida was also mentioning, it takes extraordinary conditions that that's awakened. Uh, it takes um, uh, really some, some such a devastating stories of individuals that we are moved. And this is, of course, part of the how, you know, the society and with the new technologies and everything, how we, we are uh, in which direction actually civilizations, uh, as civilization, we are, we are evolving. But I would say exactly that is the reason why we need to aspire more in terms of really living and understanding solidarity, uh, uh, aspiring more in really changing the situation in which in our each individual societies or even communities, there is so many people who need help or who are vulnerable or who, are, who need support in order to to really access the rights or access the resources. So we, in, in a sense, I would say, you know, all of us as different actors, both from civil society and, and, the, uh, uh, and the governments and then the business sector and uh, uh, even each, each individually, uh, we need to aspire more and try to imagine better societies because I see, I think this is what's missing and this is what's part of this uh, the disillusion of young people in the poli with the politics, which is also what researchers are, sh are showing. This is part of why the governments are corrupted and are not uh, accountable and they don't feel there is demand that they need to, to, to be accountable. This is why citizens believe with whatever they engage, they will not uh, make a change. And this is why they are not participating. And this is all, again, what researchers are showing. So. And I think part of the story is that we actually lack the vision, the lack, lack this image of, you know, what kind of society we want. And uh, I think it was uh, Staliana who mentioned, uh, you know, what, what unites us, what is, what is this factor that, that kind of can, can bring us together. And I think it is the values. And this is something that we forgot to discuss. This is something that we are assuming are there. We are assuming that they are shared between us, but actually, I would say from from 90s onwards, we are completely unaware how our values were developing. Not to say, you know, not to give it even a, a value opinion around that. Uh, were they deteriorating, uh, deteriorating or, or uh, you know, improving? But how they were developing and what is now, what are now the values in our society? Either those on paper or those that are, we are actually living but are not, not, not written anywhere. And this is the discussions that I think are missing the most. I think uh, uh, part of the dialogue for future uh, is also uh, uh, a contributing factor to that, to opening the spaces where uh, people from different spheres of life can actually discuss the values and kind of make this uh, uh, agreement on what it is that we want to see in our society so that we can work towards it uh, uh, jointly. And then every little effort of any one of us will actually contribute rather than be felt as a, as a wasted time or energy or just scattered around and not appreciated. Thank you, Aisha, and thank you for mentioning the value of, of conversation and, and, and ambition. I mean, if I, what I read from what you said is, is aspiring more is having this vision of the future in which all of us are shaping the conversation and, and are tapping into hopefully our shared values uh, um, around that future. Let me now go to uh, Svetlana for her comments on and, and recommendations on how do you see this interplay between governance, civil society, how do we preserve uh, the, the trust as a social capital? 
Uh, actually, I think that uh, we need to return to our basis. And uh, uh, actually, we all uh, mentioned the values and it's a core. Uh, and uh, actually, to rethink uh, what we want uh, uh, to do and how we want to live. Uh, and uh, also, if we look in, in, in uh, data, uh, we see that actually the highest level of social cohesion have Denmark, Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland. And if we uh, look at the lowest uh, uh, level of uh, social cohesion, then it's Lithuania, Latvia, Bulgaria, Greece. So it's also about our mentality in a way. Uh, but I think that uh, stimulating the dialogue and uh, openness in discussion and uh, uh, communication on right way everyday communication, uh, reminding not only officials, governments, uh, uh, civil society organization, but all actors that we are all important in this process and that uh, if we want to change something, we really need uh, to move a little bit and actually that lack of motivation uh, is also uh, in a way uh, um, seen these days because you, you, we all think that we cannot change anything. And if I look back in my 15 years of work, um, enhancing capacities of different uh, uh, gr groups, uh, young people, especially women, um, I always have the feeling that I'm always starting from the beginning. Uh, but actually, uh, it's not always like that. It just seems to me uh, that, that that's the situation. But actually, I think that we all the time need to enhance capacities of all those uh, uh, who are working on a different level. And I agree that actually uh, sometimes we just lo lose the, 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 that thought about local communities and how are they important. Uh, our capital cities okay, they are important, but actually the other things are happening on the local level. And we actually, actually noticed that uh, on Dialogue for Future program, that actually uh, uh, women coming from the smaller uh, um, surroundings and smaller cities, they need more support uh, in a way that they want to inform their relatives, their sisters, friends, about things that they really don't know about because Probably they read uh, the same newspapers or online portals or watch the same uh, uh, TV programs. And actually the role of media is crucial uh, and uh, we usually see the bad information and you just have that uh, uh, kind of moment, okay, I will just uh, uh, change the channel. Uh, but we have so much positive stories in our surroundings that we really need to uh, find a way to promote. Uh, social networks are a good platform to do that and I think that uh, uh, really work is happening on the local level and everything starts there. Uh, and I think that that um, stimulating uh, and cross-sectoral uh, uh, cooperation, uh, it's really important and only together we can all uh, change uh, uh, the thing. Uh, and if we uh, practice, I will also return once again to the mentorship work because I really think it's a crucial uh, to help each other uh, and uh, not only on a personal level, it's important of course, but also on this organizational level because time of the crisis really touched the organization of civil society and that's completely true. We are every day fighting with the new challenges. Uh, but I think if we uh, share uh, uh, our and help each other uh, and uh, stand together, uh, uh, then we can change something. And I'm really, uh, um, I, I really don't want to believe that we need 100 years to change something as we need to uh, uh, give us a woman uh, right to vote. So, but also it's, it's proof that uh, we really need to work every day and to show by example that the change can be done, but we really need to believe in what we are doing uh, and to actually be what we what we are, uh, to be honest, to be open, uh, 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 to be uh, uh, helpful. So I think that that's all the, the kind of values that we all have, but sometimes just forget to, to practice. So I really uh, uh, would like to stress that we are all together uh, in this process and only together we can change the things. Uh, thank you, Svetlana. This really dives in very well with 
uh, another segment that we're exploring in this discussion, which is the role of, of women's organizations, women's civil society in, in preserving the social trust. And because we are almost running out of time, I would like to go to audience questions because we, we have uh, a couple that uh, we'd like to discuss with you. Uh, and the first one goes to Stiliana from uh, Vesna Davidovac. And she says, how can we even more improve the image of women in the decision-making process? Often they are present, but not really heard. There is a difference between quotas and reality. How can we even further expand the influence and connectivity between individuals and groups that are representing women's rights in the region? So how do we improve the image of women in the decision-making process? Often they are present, but not really heard. Thank you, Alma, and thank you for the question uh, from the audience. Um, I think that uh, we need to address the problem from several directions. First of all, definitely uh, invest more in uh, uh, building the confidence, building the capability, building the skills of the women that occupy a public position and that go into a political avenue or in a position of management and leadership. It takes skills and uh, this is recognized and uh, definitely we need to do more uh, to equip them so that they are articulate, they're confident and, and uh, they, uh, they can be a public persona. The second dimension is definitely work more with the media uh, because the media sometimes can approach a woman leader and a man leader in a different way with some stereotypes. So this is where we really need to to change this uh, mentality, to, to change the stereotypes and to, to, to uh, position uh, more kind of fair uh, approach to uh, uh, presenting and speaking about women in leadership. It is also a matter of uh, um, sending out uh, public messages through the social media because sometimes the public also comes with the stereotypes and that's why working through the media may help also change uh, the, the public perception of the public stereotypes, the, the various hate uh, attacks uh, or um, uh, the, the messages, the violent messages that are coming in the public sphere through Facebook or through the social networks and they are really discouraging and they're motivating because it takes a lot of courage to take a public office and, and to be in a public office uh, successful and confident. So I think it's a concerted effort, but definitely I think that uh, the, the new century comes with uh, new technological and and communication challenges uh, uh, to women and leadership. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stoliana. This actually uh, echoes completely the recommendations that we had in, in the program where I'm involved with uh, at the Regional oh. Dialogue Platform for Women, which, which was organized in February in Montenegro. And it uh, clearly talked about we need to have the constructive role women and women's organizations play in social cohesion clearly uh, presented through the media because there are uh, remarkably fewer stories about how women's organizations and women leaders are contributing to social cohesion uh, as such. And, and uh, Svetlana as well mentioned that, you know, uh, certainly, you know, the organizations and the civil society do not revolve all around our capitals only. There are many, many organizations who act in smaller cities. And at the dialogue platform that we were at, there was a clear call for solidarity among the, you know, the big organizations versus the small ones in not only, as she mentioned, capacity building, but also like being able to help them with, you know, uh, influencing policy at the local level of, of giving this kind of, you know, political education, that kind of literacy, you know, media and information literacy, which was crucial, crucial for them. Uh, we have another question from uh, Ivana Stankovic, and she would like to hear from all the panelists on examples of good practice or concrete actions and organizations contributing to the overall social capital in the region. So if you'd like, Stiliana, I'll go with you last and, and give the, uh, the floor to Aida. So on, on examples of good practice uh, or uh, concrete actions contributing to the overall social capital in the region. We can't hear Aida. Sorry. Um... Thank you for the uh, question. It's actually maybe I cannot remember a concrete example in the region, but
but I believe all different initiatives that contribute to uh, transparency and dialogue are for sure important. And uh, I want to stress out about young people. Um, Aisha motivated me. Uh, that's very important. And um, I believe in all, every type of program that connects young people, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if uh, which topic is that, is it IT technologies or ecology or any type of uh, topics, but just to mix people, to make uh, them uh, opportunity to travel and to uh, meet different type of people from different regions and different uh, backgrounds and everything. That's crucial. And when you uh, intervene in someone, somebody's um, mind on that way, that nobody can erase that. When you see from your experience that uh, yeah, there are just people as uh, yourself that they have the same needs and same hopes, then uh, that's most important. And that's real antidote to different types of uh, uh, toxic influence by different stakeholders. I'm sorry, I cannot remember maybe more right now, but uh, all that type of activities are crucial. Aisha, thank you. Thank you very much. Aida, Aisha, I see you're raising your hand. Uh, what are your examples of good practice? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I think the question is so wide that we can spend another one hour trying to, to list all these different initiatives, especially because the, the social cohesion in itself as a concept is so wide. But I can mention a few that I think are, are really uh, contributing to social cohesion and have potential to do even more. Uh, uh, one is uh, uh, Regional Youth Cooperation Office, so uh, RICO, mm. uh, as, as known in the in the in the region, which uh, actually uh, brings uh, young people, uh, and not just from civil society, but also through schools, to to do uh, different projects, but through youth exchanges. And this is really interesting concept where young people from different uh, backgrounds, but also different geographical areas, are coming together, getting to know each other, and exactly experiencing let's say the diversity existing and then uh, uh, are less less uh, uh, man less possible it is then less possible to manipulate them into you know seeing the others as enemies let's say uh, I, I i always mention also one example which i think is it's um, particularly important for women solidarity which is uh, uh, organization of women and entrepreneur entrepreneurs I'm always struggling with this term, so sorry, <laughs> with women entrepreneurs from Montenegro who are offering a mentoring scheme and support scheme for a new uh, woman and new in business initiatives in, in, in this field so that they support each other to, to become more successful. And I think it was mentioned, for instance, one, one more uh, topic is also how uh, uh, young people were actually uh, being a volunteers and being a force of solidarity in the region when the, the, the when the pandemic broke even though usually as societies i would say we we see them more as a you know disruptive force and somebody who is more uh, a problem and we don't know what to do with them etc which i completely disagree with but they were actually showing that they have so much to offer and that they can be this this uh, uh, this force to count in if again uh, uh, reinforcing this this message if we actually give them opportunities and and offer them different uh, ways of uh, communicating and and uh, uh, kind of driving that that uh, uh, volunteer energy that they are bringing in that is always uh, that is always there so this is just few to 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 start and i would suggest uh, to to whoever was was asking this question but also the others who are interested just look around, uh, look for the civil society or people around or uh, uh, just some great people also within the institutions who are trying to move things. And you can join those and see if, you know, if those will work for, for yourself. If not, of course, you can always start with, with your own initiatives. But I think the, the, the part of the answer is also in synergies. So trying to, to really connect with the others and, and uh, uh, contribute to some of those uh, examples. I hope this, this helps. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aisha. This was very useful. Um, Steliana, you had your hand up. So uh, what are your thoughts on, on examples of, of good practice? Uh, I, I would like to provide an example that I found very inspirational. Uh, it refers to the post-flood recovery, um, and it was around already 2017 or 2016, 
18, so a bit after the floods. But what happened then is that municipalities and mayors from a river basin have worked together to sign agreements of collaboration of how to understand the risks from the floods along the river basins, how to work together. Uh, and then, moreover, I think this experience spilled over across borders. So we had a wave of initiatives when mayors from across the borders, in case of transboundary rivers, had the same type of cooperation put in place. So this, what this shows to me is a clear application of uh, a notion of trust and social capital applied to preparedness or a willingness to work collectively to avoid crisis in the future. Because definitely what we need to learn is that this incidence of natural disasters, forests, fires, floods, droughts, etc., etc., in uh, our times are much more frequent. So it's also being ready uh, for that means that being ready to work together for that. Thank you. That's a wonderful notion that you mentioned is that uh, definitely um, our world has more shared challenges than individual national challenges and shared challenges call for shared shared solutions. Uh, Svetlana, last but not least, uh, could I also hear your views on, on examples of good practice before we close? And we are somewhat over time. I hope we will still be online uh, to, to wrap this up. Thank you. Uh, actually, yeah, uh, my, my previous colleagues mentioned uh, some of them, but I want to mention one uh, important initiative. It's the actual initiative Women of the Balkans for the New Politics. And actually, it started three years ago, Belgrade Fund for Political Excellence uh, with the support of OSC Mission to Serbia. And actually, the idea was to bring together uh, women politicians and women coming from uh, uh, civil society organization, from business, uh, uh, from different areas of work uh, to talk together about the uh, problems we are all facing uh, every day and to try actually in a way to help those who are in the position of making and uh, making decisions uh, to have also the another view and another perspective uh, from civil society organization but also from different other different uh, areas uh, and uh, that somehow it's important that we really uh, need to connect more and that is actually the the proof that we can uh, uh, also, uh, it's a good starting point actually, and we really hope that the network will uh, uh, have a new members uh, in the uh, next years and that we will more develop because it's really important that to help each other and to actually help those who are in the uh, position uh, to make decisions, that have some executive roles and to uh, uh, talk about the uh, problems that we are facing as a woman uh, on, in our everyday life, but also uh, in other different uh, areas. And uh, a lot of, uh, and I will once again actually uh, um, talk about uh, uh, DFF, actually Direct for Future program. It's also a, a good example uh, how we can together uh, make stronger relations, uh, not on, only among young people, they are important uh, and really important for all of us, uh, because they are in a way future uh, of our countries, uh, but also uh, uh, teachers, uh, uh, those who are in educational systems, System, uh, young women coming from the women's organization, but also students and those who are in the beginning of their careers, because they really need support. Our or our societies are uh, uh, like still a uh, uh, very traditional one, and uh, sometimes that support that they don't have and get in their own surroundings coming from all of us, uh, and also. Uh, uh, the notions that we that actually that uh, we know that we are not alone uh, it's always helpful to change and to be actually leaders in our local surroundings thank you so much svetlana this is a wonderful way to uh you know close today's panel uh what resonates with me is that we're not alone um, so, you know, and only together and, and by working together and supporting each other, we can through either, uh, obviously, these formal networks that are established, you've certainly mentioned even organizations and, and networks that, that uh, support not only young people, but women and women's leaders and, uh, you know, the importance of empathy and courage 
to face not only this challenge, but the challenge of, of maintaining uh, the, the trust that we have, the importance of inclusive governance, of, of transparency, the importance of uh, remaining connected and uh, remaining engaged as well, and the importance of, of uh, you know, media and information literacy for understanding and for acting on information and, and for being engaged citizens. So um, I would like to thank you all. It has been really a pleasure to moderate this panel and to enjoy this discussion. My only regret is that we're not physically all together in one place. Hopefully in the next iteration of the Belgrade Security Forum, we will see each other there and, and uh, continue this discussion with new impetus, new ideas, and, and new examples of great practice. And I, I wish you a great rest of the day and, and thank you.